You turned it on already? Oh. Welcome to the Congregation of Yahweh. We're here on Yahweh's Sabbath Day. Greetings to those on the internet or those that uh, might be watching live. Uh, today's message is entitled, Not Being Under the Law is synonymous with having the law in your heart. And I'm going to touch on the covenants today. Uh, there's a lot of confusion as to what the covenants are. Uh, in today's mentality, we believe, well not we, in today's the mainstream doctrines, their understanding is that Genesis to Malachi is the Old Testament or the Old Covenant and Matthew to Revelations is the New Testament or the New Covenant. And uh, the way the masses have have interpret this as we're Christians we live from Matthew to Revel to Revelations and those poor old Jews they live from Genesis to Malachi uh, but we're going to clarify some of that today and uh, we're also going to clarify what it means to be under the law or to not be under the law when we see verses like we're not under the law but under grace the way that is interpreted as the law does not apply to us because we're under grace uh, but that's actually not the writer's intent um, the Messiah his disciples Paul none of those people being raised uh, in the scriptures would ever contradict the scriptures or tell other people to break the scriptures in any way shape or form form or they would actually be worthy of breaking the scriptures uh, <laughs> if they told people it was okay not to adhere to the scriptures then uh, they're actually disobeying right there because it says if anyone tries to draw you away from, the, from these things they need to be stoned on the spot to get the evil out from amongst your people um, I'm going to start off in Jeremiah chapter 31 and the first thing I want to clarify is um, there's, there's another uh, frame of thought about covenants some people believe there's only one covenant in scripture and that it just had a snowball effect and, and kind of got added to along the way and that the new covenant is actually just a renewal of something old and it's it's the same thing it just came back to came back around again uh, I, I just want to clarify what you know what I personally believe about that and I'm gonna try to use the scriptures to do that and I believe it's very clear in the scriptures that there is something old and there is something new and um, <clears throat> start off in, in Jeremiah chapter 31 this is the only place from Genesis to Malachi where it actually says New Covenant. And this verse is quoted in Hebrews chapter 8 and Hebrews chapter 10. And, you know, there's a lot of people out there that claim to be New Testament or New Covenant Christians. And if this is the only verse that says anything about New Covenant, then those people claiming to be New Covenant Christians need to somehow identify with this verse here. Again, this is the only place. And when it's spoken of in the New Testament, it's actually just quoting this verse twice, or these the set of verses. Jeremiah 31, verse 31, Behold, the days come, saith Yahweh, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. Here, I see that it's a very clear definition that you have a new covenant with Israel and Judah and it's not according to the covenant that he made with them when he brought them out of Egypt. It's not like that. Okay. Which my covenant they break, I was a husband unto them, saith Yahweh. But this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith Yahweh. I will put my law in their inward parts and write it in their hearts and will be their Elohim and they shall be my people. So the new covenant is having his law in your heart. So all of the people that claim to be New Covenant followers of the Messiah, do they have his law in their heart? Or are they listening to the doctrines of the preachers out there saying that the law was done away with? I submit to you that if you want to be in the New Covenant, you need to have his law in your heart. Does all the law apply to you? Absolutely not. Will the law save you? Absolutely not. But if you can keep it, then it will bless you. It's for your good. Our salvation only comes through the Son. By grace you're saved through faith, not of works, but we are His workmanship. He has called us to be renewed in the mind to become an obedient people, a spirit-led people that want to obey Him, that have a desire to obey Him. And it's very easy. It's very easy to be led astray into the deceptions 
that his word was done away with. And the reason it's so easy is because of the flesh. In Romans chapter 8, it says the carnal mind is an enemy of Yahweh. It cannot be submissive to his law. The fleshly mentality, the rebellious mind does not want to be submissive. So when a doctor comes along and says, you don't have to obey that. That was only for the Jews or you don't have to do that. That's the old covenant. The flesh likes that because it doesn't want to obey. And a lot of people, instead of researching what they're hearing or challenging it for himself, that sounds good. I don't want to obey. That sounds real good. I like that. I'm going to stick with what that preacher says. This preacher over here. He says, obey the commandments. This preacher over here says, eh, that's old, done away with, fulfilled, obsolete. Don't worry about that. Well, that one sounds better to the flesh. Uh, and now a lot of people believe that we haven't entered into the new covenant yet. And the reason that is, is in verse uh, 34, it says, and they shall teach no more every man his neighbor and every man his brother saying, Know Yahweh, for they shall all know me from the least of them unto the greatest of them, said Yahweh, for I will forgive their iniquity and I will remember their sin no more. Now a lot of people say, well, everybody's still being taught, so we can't be in the new covenant yet. Well, that's actually not what it says. It says that uh, they won't teach everyone to know him. Let's go to 1 John real quick. And actually, we can actually uh, identify uh, identify both points of view in 1st John 1st <clears throat> John chapter 1 and verse I'm sorry chapter 2 and verse 27 says but the anointing which you have received of him abides in you and you need not that any man teach you but as that same anointing teaches you of all things and is truth and is no lie and even as it hath taught you you shall abide in him. So here it says you have no need that any man teach you. And I used to use that verse to explain the new covenant. But then after, you know, meditating on that a little more, it doesn't say anything about people being taught. It's about people being taught to know Yahweh. And then in chapter 1 of 1 John, verse 3, it says, Hereby we do know that we know him if we keep his commandments. So it's the people that keep his commandments that know him. So if you're in the new covenant and you have his law in your hearts, you don't need to be taught to know him because keeping the commandments is knowing him. So I submit that if you're in the new covenant and you have his law in your hearts, then uh, you don't have to be taught to know him. That's the proof that you know him. Next verse. Um, I'm sorry. Somehow I flipped. Way on the other side of the book. <laughs> uh, First John, the next one says, He that says, I know him, and keeps not his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. Now, there's a lot of people that's not keeping the commandments because they just don't know. They're not doing it out of re rebellion. But th th what this verse is talking about is somebody that knows it and is not keeping it and claims to know him, they're a liar. But whosoever keeps his word in him, very the love of Elohim is perfected. Hereby know that we know him. So it's by keeping his word and his commandments, it's the evidence that we know him. Now, another part of the, the new covenant that has not come to, to fruition is coming into the land. And that's a repetitive theme all throughout Scripture, specific, uh, specifically um, in uh, Ezekiel 34 through 37. All of those chapters talk about coming back to the land. Um, now, let me go to... Actually, let me go there. Let me go there. That's Ezekiel 36. And that theme is, is repeated several times uh, throughout those scriptures. But this one is, is very plain. And the wording uh, is indicative of the New Covenant... 36, I'm going to start in verse 19. And I scattered them amongst the heathen, and they were dispersed throughout all the countries. That was a curse for their disobedience, talking about Israel. According to their way and according to their doings, I judged them. And when they entered into the heathen where they went, they profaned my name when they said to them, These are the people of Yahweh that are gone forth out of his land. 
But I had pity for my holy name, which the house of Israel had profaned amongst the heathen where they went. So they were living in sin. Because of their sin, they were scattered to the nations. And because they were scattered, they took that rebellious nature out there with them. And it made his name look bad. They brought profanity on his name. and uh, But he had pity for his name. So this is what he's going to do in verse uh, 22. Therefore say to the house of Israel, Thus saith the sovereign Yahweh, I do not this for your sakes, O house of Israel, but for my holy name's sake, which you have profaned amongst the heathen where you went. And I will sanctify my great name, which was profaned amongst the heathen, which you have profaned in the midst of them, and the heathen shall know. That I am Yahweh, saith the sovereign Yahweh, when I shall be sanctified in you before their eyes. For I will take you out from amongst the heathen, and gather you out of all countries, and will bring you into your own land. Then will I sprinkle clean water upon you, and you shall be clean from all your filthiness, and from all your idols will I cleanse you. A new heart also will I give you, and a new spirit will I put within you. And I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh, and I will give you a heart of flesh. So, this sprinkling of the water seems to be indicative of the outpouring of the Spirit, which gives you a new heart and a new spirit that he puts inside of you. And what does this new spirit do in uh, verse 27? And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes, and you shall keep my judgments and do them. And you shall dwell in the land that I gave to your fathers, and you shall be my people, and I will be your Elohim. So this ties in, this, uh, this new spirit and this new heart that causes you to obey seems to be synonymous with Jeremiah 31 that says, I will put my laws in your inner parts and write it in your hearts. So the only part of this that hasn't taken place is actually coming into the land and that that has to do when the messiah returns he will return and sit on the throne of david uh as the prophecy said and also the angel in luke chapter one said that this child will sit on the throne of david his father and rule over the house of israel forever and um and let's go to hebrews chapter eight this is where it's quoting jeremiah 31 a lot of people thought that or think that something was wrong with the old covenant. Something was wrong with the instructions that were given. Something was wrong with the commandments that he gave. So things had to change and, and now we do something new. But I'm going to show you here in the scriptures that there wasn't nothing wrong with his word. The problem was the people. And it's the people that he came to change. The heart of man he came to change. And our goal should be that of uh, David in Psalms 119 verse 11. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against you. When his word is truly in our heart, we don't want to sin against him. And that is the new covenant. <laughs> um, hallelujah. Uh, he Hebrews chapter 8 verse 6 says... But now hath he obtained a more excellent ministry, by how much also he is the meteor, mediator of a better covenant. Here we kind of see a separation. We see an old covenant, and here we see a better covenant, which was established upon better promises. For if the first covenant had been faultless, then should no place have been sought for a second. So here again we see another separation. For finding fault with them, he saith, Behold, the days come, saith Yahweh, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Finding fault with them. The people. He found fault with the people that didn't want to keep it. So he said, A new covenant that I'm going to make with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to lead them out of Egypt. And if anybody... Um, Let's go. Let's look at what that old covenant is. What was the old covenant? A lot of people might say the Sabbath was the old covenant. The Ten Commandments were the old covenant. The feast days, the dietary laws, was the old covenant. And we actually, we actually read uh, today uh, in the reading that Noah knew the difference between clean and unclean. He didn't have to tell him what clean was. He didn't have to tell him what unclean. He just said they're going on the ark this way, and. Uh, Okay, that's in Exodus chapter 19 and verse 3. Exodus 19 and 3. This is before the law was given. 
Israel entered into a covenant. In 19.3 it says, And Moses went up unto Elohim, and Yahweh called unto him out of the mountain, saying, Thus shalt thou say to the house of Jacob, and tell the children of Israel, You have seen what I did unto the Egyptians, and how I bear you on eagles' wings, and brought you unto myself. Now therefore, if you will obey my voice indeed, and keep my covenant, or my agreement, then you shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people, for all the earth is mine. And you shall be unto me a kingdom of priests, and a holy nation. These are the words which thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel. And Moses came and called for the elders of the people and laid before their faces all these words which Yahweh commanded him. And all the people answered together and said, All that Yahweh has spoken we will do. And Moses returned the words of the people unto Yahweh. That was the covenant. If you obey me, you'll be my people. I will be your El. Bam. That was the covenant. After they entered into the covenant, he said, okay, this is how I want you to live. Then he manifested what his ways were, which have always been his ways. It's been his ways from the beginning. He doesn't change. His word doesn't change. Um, I'm going to go back to Hebrews real quick. Hebrews chapter 8. Yeah, in verse um, 9 is where I left off. Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt because they continued not in my covenant and I regarded them not, saith Yahweh. For this is the new covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith Yahweh. I will put my laws into their mind and write it in their hearts and I will will be to them an Elohim and they shall be my people and they shall not teach every man his neighbor and every man his brother saying no Yahweh for all shall know me from the least to the greatest for I will be merciful to their unrighteousness and their sins and their iniquities I will remember no more in that he saith a new covenant he hath made the first old which now that which decays and wax old is ready to vanish um, now the way people interpret that last verse there is Matthew to Revelations is still good. Genesis to Malachi, that's, that's old stuff. But what it's saying is that agreement, that agreement, if you obey me, then I will be your L. The reason that's starting to vanish away is because he is putting his law inside the hearts and minds of his people. It's not two-sided. It's not if you do this, I will do that. It's just happening. His son came and died. The spirit was poured out, and he's changing people. Um... And again, in verse 13, we see that separation, old and new. Um, 2 Corinthians chapter 3. Second Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 1. Do we, do we begin again to commend ourselves? Or need we, as some others, epistles of commendation to you or letters of commendation from you? Do we need letters of recommendation? Is what he's saying. You are our epistle, written in our hearts, known and read of all men. He's saying you are the evidence. For as much as you are manifestly declared to be the epistle of the Messiah, ministered by us, written not with ink, but with the spirit of the living Elohim, not in tables of stone, but in fleshly tables of the heart. We see a comparison here. Some written in stone, that agreement was written in stone, how they were supposed to live, and written in fleshly tablets of the heart. And such trust have we through the Messiah toward Elohim. Not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think anything as of ourselves, but our sufficiency is of Elohim, who hath made us able ministers of the new covenant, not of the letter, but of the spirit. For the letter kills, but the spirit gives life. Here's another misinterpreted verse. They think that old letter was bad because it kills. But, you know, we got the spirit. The only time the letter kills is when you disobey it. The wages of sin is death. When you're walking in the spirit, in the spirit of truth, that guides you into truth, that leads you to obey the truth, uh, he wouldn't lead you to transgress the letter. But if the ministration of death written and engraven in stones was in splendor, let me skip down to uh, verse 13. 
and not as Moses, which put a veil over his face, that the children of Israel could not steadfastly look to the end of that which was being done away. But their minds, and let's, let's put a little side note on that. What was actually being done away? Now, today's mentality is, of course, everything prior to the book of Matthew was done away with. Or all those old laws and commandments were being done away with. But what I'm trying to show you here is that agreement. You have to obey me in order for me to be your L and you to be my people. That agreement is being done away with because he is putting his law and his commandments inside of his people. You don't have to do it first for him to be. It's not a prerequisite. It's just happening. He's doing it by an act of love. Um. But their minds were blinded, for until this day remains the same veil, unremoved in the reading of the Old Covenant, which veil is done away in the Messiah. But even unto this day, when Moses is read, the veil is upon their heart. What is this veil? They have some type of blindness in that covenant of, if you obey me, then I will be your L and you will be my people. And I think that veil is found in Romans chapter 9. Romans chapter 9, starting in verse 30. What shall we say then? That the Gentiles, which followed not after righteousness, have attained to righteousness, even the righteousness which is of faith. But Israel, which followed after the law of righteousness, hath not attained to the law of righteousness. Why? Because they sought it not by faith, but as it were by works of the law, for they stumbled at the stumbling stone. That veil that was upon their heart was thinking that it was by the works of the law, which that was the covenant. If you obey me, then I will be your L, you will be my people. But they didn't mix it with faith. Because they sought it not by faith, but as it were by works of the law. For they stumbled at the stumbling stone. As it is written, Behold, I lay in Zion a stumbling stone and a rock of offense, and whosoever believes on him shall not be ashamed. And we have to have faith in this Messiah. And if we have faith in him, we will not be ashamed. But those that lacked faith stumbled at the stumbling stone. Um, <clears throat> weren't, they, weren't they believing in different We'll, we'll dig into we'll dig into that a little a little later. Let's look in uh, Romans chapter six. Romans chapter six and verse one. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? And I know a lot of people have heard this message uh, many times. I've spent a lot of time in Romans uh, 6 through 8. And I'm not going to go through the whole thing today, but I, I do want to point out a few things. Uh, in order to identify what sin is, we've got to use the scriptures to identify. Romans chapter 3 verse 20 says, By the law is the knowledge of sin. Uh, Romans chapter 7 verse 7 says, I had not known lust except the law had said, Thou shalt not covet. Romans chapter 4 verse 15 says where there is no law there is no transgression and 1 John chapter 3 verse 4 says sin is transgression of the law so when we read about sin we have to use the Bible to define itself and we understand that it's his law that identifies what sin is okay so shall we continue to transgress his law that grace may abound certainly not May that never be. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? What does it mean to be dead to sin? We're, we're, about to, we're about to find out. He's about to use some synonymous terms in the rest of this chapter. To be dead to sin. Okay, verse 3. Know you not that so many of us as were baptized into Yeshua the Messiah were baptized into his death. Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into death that like as the Messiah was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. In the same way he died and was resurrected, we need to die and be resurrected and that is to be dead to sin when we truly die we are dead to sin a little more information on that verse 
5. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man is impaled or crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed. If, if the old man is dead, you're dead to sin. If the old nature has truly died, you're dead to sin. Verse uh, Verse 7 says, for he that is dead is freed from sin. Because it's the old nature, the old man that wants to sin. Um, over here in, in, in chapter 7. Chapter 7 verse 1 says, Know you not, brethren, for I speak to them that know the law, how that the law has dominion over a man as long as he lives. If people would really meditate on that, what that verse is saying, it would open up a whole new realm of thought. Those that know the law know that as long as you're alive, the law has dominion over you. And then he gives an, gives an example in chapter 2 through 4. He says, if a woman's husband dies, she is set free from the law of her husband. But if, if uh, he lives and she marries another, she'll, she'll, she'll be called an adulteress. He uses that as an illustration. All of chapter 6, there's a repetitive theme of something dying. Death, death, death. And it's talking about the old man dying. And then he uses this illustration of marriage to say, just like that husband died and set the wife free, so must we also die so that we can be set free. That's in verse uh, 5. I mean verse 4, excuse me. Wherefore, my brethren... You also are become dead to the law by the body of Messiah, that you should be married to another, even to him who is raised from the dead, that we should bring forth fruit unto Elohim. And he goes on in the rest of this chapter, which you know we went over you know many times, that the rebellious nature is holding on to us. When the rebellious nature sees a law that says, Thou shalt not commit adultery well the rebellious nature uh, can look on a woman and lust after her in his heart and commit adultery already and that rebellious nature you know there's different levels you know people have taken the rebellious nature to extreme and that's kind of the role of raising your children in the way that they should go so that they don't get too far into the rebellious nature that's uh, that might tie in with the, the schoolmaster there but anyway, um, we need to be delivered from the rebellious nature so that we won't be under the law. Because it's the rebellious nature that wants to break the law. It's the rebellious nature that uh, we have to overcome. And how do we do that? Surrender. Repent. Confess. Father, you know, when we come to a point in our life when we say, Father, I realize I was wrong. I feel I, I, I realize I need a Savior. Forgive me for what I've done. I'm repenting. I want to walk in newness of life. Give me of your spirit. The Bible says, ask for his spirit and it will be given. And what does this spirit do? If we're not deceived by the man-made doctrines out there, that's what that, re that really hinders the spirit. When you start listening to man-made doctrines out there and you don't listen to the spirit of truth that guides you into all this, but if you're, if you're willing to test what you hear, if you're willing to test what the preachers are saying and see if it lines up with the word of Yahweh, then when you say, Father, give me of your spirit, he will guide you into truth. He will guide you into obeying the truth. And by surrendering to him every day, that's what keeps that old nature down in the grave. By feeding the spirit man, by feeding the spirit man with his word, by feeding the spirit man with fellowship with other believers and not worldly people who pour out their corruption into your life. A little leaven leavens the whole lump. Pray that it's holy, spiritual leaven that's going to be uh, feeding your spirit man. But, the, you know, I'm going to sum it up with this. If you're truly in the new covenant... You're putting the old nature to death every day. And by doing that, you're not under the law. What puts you under the law? Walking in the flesh. Well, let, let's find, I'm going to close out with this. 1 Timothy 
chapter 1 and verse 8. This is who's under the law, ladies and gentlemen. But we know that the law is good if a man uses it lawfully. You know, that's a repetitive theme in, in Romans chapter 7. He says that the commandments are holy and just and good. Here it says, we know that the law is good if a man use it lawfully. Knowing this, that the law is not made for a righteous man, but for the lawless, for disobedient, for the wicked, for sinners, for unholy and profane, for murderers of fathers, murderers of mothers, for manslayers, for whoremongers, for homosexuals, for men stealers, for liars, for perjured persons. And if there be any other thing that is contrary to sound doctrine, if you're doing those things, you're still under the law because it's pointing out what you're doing it's pointing out the sin that you're doing and you're under the condemnation of it but when you have a renewed mind a, re a new heart and a new spirit you don't want to live like that anymore so you're not under the law <laughs> hallelujah <laughs>